very good to see everyone here today. Appreciate your attendance. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. We begin this morning by thinking about when we follow Satan in our lives, he ends up controlling our lives. He ends up as our master. He will usually start out with just a little enticement to get us involved in a little sin, but then it's a little more and a little more until we are filled with sin. And that type of life is a life of misery, of suffering. Now, at first, it seems like it's exciting, it's thrilling, there's pleasure in it because there is pleasure in sin. Otherwise, we really wouldn't be enticed to get involved in it. But then it turns into that root of bitterness as time goes by, as we suffer the consequences of our sins. And when we are caught up in this, we're not in our right mind. We are not fulfilling the very reason for which we have been created and put on this earth. It's contrary to our nature. In spite of what the world may say, sin is contrary to our nature. It's not how we are supposed to be. When we get caught up in this, when Satan is our master, we cannot escape it or get out of it on our own. We want to notice in Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 5, how there's an example here, if you will, a physical manifestation of someone who is controlled by the devil. As we read about the one who is named Legion, this man who is possessed with many demons. And we see in him what type of reality it is when you've been filled with Satan, when you've been filled with sin and unrighteousness. In Mark chapter 5 then, we want to begin reading in verse 1. Let's read all the way down through 20 to get the story. Then we'll begin to back up here in just a minute and pull some different segments of this out as we walk through it and make some application. So Mark chapter 5 verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying out and cutting himself with stones." When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about two thousand. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been de de demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him and had been, who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they begged began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis 
all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. This account is also recorded in Matthew and in Luke. In Matthew's account, he mentions two men who are demon-possessed. And so this is one of those cases where the different writers record different details, and Mark and Luke focus on the more prominent or maybe the worst case of demon possession, as it mentions here that he has legion within him. And again, this shows the physical side of the destruction that comes along. It's sort of a concrete example of what it's like to have your life controlled by the devil. And it helps us to understand what it is to be spiritually tormented when we have Satan in our lives and ruling our lives and leading us through life. This account took place, of course, in the land of Israel around the Sea of Galilee and really on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Today, as I understand it, this Gadara, the place where the Gadarenes live, this Gadara is identified with a, a town named Kersey. And so it's on the east side of Galilee. And it says that the man had dwelt among the tombs, that he had been there and had come out, he lived there, and this is sort of a representation of what the tombs would look like, a, a little bit closer representation of how that the people would dig into the rocks and they would live, or this individual lived in that area. That's where he spent his time. He was not with civilization, he was not in a normal shelter, but he was in among the tombs. And so thinking about where this man is, we want to go on and notice the first point is that life with demons is torture. Again, as it says here that this man in verses 1 through 5, he was demon-possessed. It says that as he was there, that he was, no one could bind him with the chains. No one could shackle him, if you will. And that's the idea... If, to me, it reflects on, you know, if you're filled with the devil, you won't be restrained. You won't be held back by things. It says that this man cried out day and night, cutting himself with stones. In Luke's account and these other accounts, it points out that he had no clothes on. Now, I don't know if that means 100% without any clothes, or as in other cases where it talks about where someone is naked, it means they might have like a loincloth on or something like that. But however it is, as he is demon-possessed, he is not properly clothed. It talked about him living in the tombs and dwelling among the mountains there, and of course how that he was a violent man. And we want to understand that life in the world in league with demons is a miserable life. If you go to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. We want to notice a few verses here in James 3 and then also in James chapter 4. James 3 verse 13. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. And then you jump down to verse 1 of chapter 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So we see when we have that earthly wisdom, or as it's described here, demonic wisdom in our life, we follow after Satan, that our life is filled with trouble and trial. It's filled with the envy, the bitterness, 
We're angry. We're upset all the time. We're fighting with others. We're attacking others. So it's like that individual that was dwelling among the tombs being possessed with those demons. He cried out day and night. He could not find any relief or any rest. As James goes on to talk about, you know, the wars and the fighting that you have among you. Warring in your members. You have that internal turmoil that is constantly going on. There are some people, because of their sin, they abuse themselves. And they destroy their bodies. They might do that through alcohol or drugs. Or they might do as this man did, through cutting themselves. They want to relieve themselves of pain and it's almost like, well, if I give myself physical pain, it will relieve my emotional pain. There are those who have no shame when they're caught up in sin, when they follow after the devil. They don't wear the proper clothing. And here it talks about they're not in their right mind. They have no dignity. They have no self-respect. They go out into public in a manner where they are exposing themselves, thinking that that attention maybe will be pleasing and acceptable to others. It makes them feel better at times. There are those who live in filth, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. Is this man's living among the tombs? I don't take it that all those tombs were empty free from corpses. He's living among the dead there in those tombs. He's violent. People get involved in sin. Sometimes they become very violent toward others, but with wrath and anger, unrestrained emotions. And again, they're not in their right mind. They're not bound by godly restraints. When we look at this man that was dwelling among the tombs, we might look at him with some measure of compassion. That's a terrible state to live in. Well, do we see ourselves in that same way? Do we see others in that same way when they are spiritually bound by the devil, when they are living tormented in misery day in and day out because they've been caught up in sin? Now look again in James chapter 3. James chapter 3, notice verses 17 and 18 and what it says there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So there's one way and one condition of living in sin that brings heartache and sorrow and pain and there's another way of living in Christ that brings peace and happiness, that brings goodness and purity into your life. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, we notice here verses 8 through 10, where Paul mentions this, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. When we live for the Lord, we'll be prayerful as we talked about in our Bible class this morning. We'll be humble before God and we will be holy. He goes on to say this in verse 9, In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. So again, you think about that man who's demon-possessed. He's running around without clothes. And here it says, 1 Timothy chapter 2, that women who are going to be godly are going to be properly dressed, appropriately dressed. That's the idea of the covering up. That's when we are in our right minds. When we are serving the Lord in purity, in peaceableness, conducting ourselves in a holy and righteous manner day in and day out. So Jesus gets there. He gets out of the boat. 
the man who had been living among the tombs and in the mountains there comes running to him and bows down before him. Now this is in that area that you see on the screen there. It's in that area and it's on this steep slope as we're going to read about in just a moment. The thing I want us to look at is the fact that these demons are powerless against Christ. So let's go back to Matthew, or rather Mark chapter 5, and read again verses 6 through 13. Mark 5, verses 6 through 13, it says, When Jesus saw, or when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you, by God, that you do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. The first thing we want to note is that these demons acknowledge Jesus as Lord. As they come before Him and they say, that He is Son of Most High God. They recognize His nature. They recognize His power. We know that James talks about in James chapter 2 that the demons believe and tremble. They knew exactly who Jesus was, but they are doomed because of their disobedience. They are doomed because they refuse to submit to the will of God and let His will rule in their lives. And any time we refuse to submit to the will of God, we are just like them. We can believe in God, but if we refuse to submit to God, we are no better off than those demons. They recognized who He was and they recognized their condition before Him, that they were doomed. And how that they come and ask Him or ask and begged that they should not be sent out of the country. Now, other accounts of Matthew and Luke talk about that they would not be thrown into the abyss, that God would not torment them at that time. And so they're begging to be spared, to have some measure of restraint shown toward them. Because they know the Lord has this great power to be able to do this. And so they ask permission of Him that they would be able to go into the swine instead of being cast into the abyss. Now, I don't know if they understood what was going to happen once they got into the swine, but they had to ask permission just to go to the swine because they had no power. They realized we have no control now right here. We're in the presence of the Son of the Most High God. And so they ask the permission to go into the swine. They are granted that permission and what this does is it shows a concrete evidence that there was an exorcism, if you will, that took place. That the people who are witnessing this, and there are evidently multiple people from that area that are witnessing what's happening, they see that this man is not in his right mind, he's being controlled by these demons, and then all of a sudden they see those swine go berserk, if you will, and run violently down that hill into the sea and they drown in the sea. That told them the nature and the magnitude of that demon possession because they could not see how many demons were in that man. But when they see this herd of about 2,000 swine, they get an understanding of what had been going on. And so it again points to the power of Jesus Christ and how that these demons were powerless before Him. Now then, it says that this man is not allowed to go with Jesus. We jump to the end of the account, verses 18 to 20. And how that this man wants to go with Jesus. He wants to be with Him. And that's understandable. 
He had been in such a terrible condition and now he is much better. He's clothed now. He's in his right mind. And so he wants to go with the Lord and spend time with Him. But the Lord tells him he can't do that. Again, in verse 18, Jesus got into the boat. He had been demon-possessed, begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. That idea of Decapolis is there is a, a region there. So beyond Gadara, he goes into a wider region telling everyone what the Lord had done for him. So this man glorified Christ because he had been helped and shown mercy by Christ. And this just tells us everything we ask of the Lord will not be granted. Remember 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, 1 John 5 and verse 14 where we're being told there that we are to appeal to God, yes, this is a confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. We have to ask according to God's will and it's only what is according to His will that will be granted. Sometimes the things that we want to do, the things that we may even see as good, will not happen for us, will not be granted to us. Because there's something better that we should be doing, that we should be involved in. And that is essentially what the Lord is telling him here. It would be good for him to be with the Lord, but the Lord says, there's something better I have for you to do. Go and tell people what I've done for you. And so he goes and he tells people, let's always understand the Lord knows best. We have to trust in him as he works in our life, as he works through providence that God knows what's best for us. We don't always know what is best for us, and He knows what is best for His kingdom and for the people who are around us. And it may be that we don't get what we want, but when we follow the Lord's will, we are a blessing to the people who surround us in life. Now then... Let's back up to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 and notice verses 14 and following. Mark 5 verse 14. So when those who fed the swine fled, they told it in the city, in the country, and they went to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. When we read that, we think how odd that is that they asked the Lord to depart from their region. And the picture we have on the screen here is from the west side of the Sea of Galilee looking over to the east. So looking to that region of Gadara. And Jesus left that region. He went over there. He cast out the demon. The people hear about this. They come out and see this man. And now he is normal. He is rational. He is calm. They see that the man has returned and they ask Jesus, please leave. To us, that seems really odd, but let's understand Jesus does not force himself on men. He does not stay where he is not welcome. When Jesus was asked to leave, he left. In Revelation chapter 22, Revelation 22, verse 17, as the letter's being closed out here, there's this call, there's this cry to mankind, really, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come and let him who hears say, Come and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. 
You know, Psalm 110 said that he would have volunteers when he was reigning and ruling at the right hand of God. See, Jesus wants us to desire to serve Him. He wants our willing submission to Him in our life. If we are not willing, the Lord will not force us to do His will. Now, why these people asked Jesus to leave, I don't know. He obviously had power to heal more. And later in the Gospel accounts, it talks about Him going back to that region, near to that region, and how that they brought their people out to be healed by Him. But right now, these people have a problem. They're scared. Maybe it is that they are living in sin and they recognize there's a great man of God here. We have things we need to hide. Maybe that's why it is. Maybe they're concerned about material loss as that herd of swine ran off into the water and drowned. But whatever it is, they did not accept Jesus and embrace Him for who He was. Even though they had evidence of His great power right before them. Jesus, of course, returned back to the other side. And the thing is, let's understand that if we resist Jesus, maybe He will return, maybe there will be another door of opportunity open for us at some point in the future, but there is some point in our life when we will have the last opportunity to embrace the Lord, to submit to His will. And if we refuse that last opportunity, whenever that may be, we're doomed forever. If you will, open your hymn books to 849. 849. When we allow Satan into our life, little by little he'll take as much as he can, take as much control as he can over our life. And we'll end up being tormented day by day because of that sin and what it's doing and eating away at our soul. So we need to go to Christ to get that sin out of our life. Not refusing Him, not rejecting Him, not pushing Him out of our life, not trying to get Him to go away, but to embrace Him and giving up that sin, seeking His mercy and His forgiveness. And the Lord will give us that mercy and that forgiveness. Today, if you realize the devil has control of you, you have it within your ability to turn to the Lord and to break that control, to seek God's forgiveness, the mercy that He has offered through His Son. So if you recognize that, you've never become a child of God, won't you become one by turning away from your sin, confessing Jesus as the Christ, and being baptized to have your sins washed away? If you're a child of God, that He has come back into your life, that His Satan has come back in, won't you reject Him, push Him out of your life by again returning to the Lord? If you have a need, we invite you to come forward while we stand and while we sing.